When it comes to motorsport experience, there are few people in the supercars pit lane who have ticked as many boxes as Adrian Burgess. The current head of motorsport at supercars has a wealth of experience across a vast range of categories, and I got the opportunity to pick his brains about some of the stories, challenges, and lessons that he's picked up along the way. Adrian, welcome. It's great to chat to you. We're going to start on your diverse background in motorsport. You've had such a journey and I'm sure we could spend a full day covering it, but summarise in a nutshell where that journey started and how it's taken you to where you are now. Yeah, I've been around the block, so to speak. This is season 36 or well, 37. Started as a 15 year old. Uh, I was always keen on racing a little bit in the family. Brothers and uncle did a little bit of racing while I was a uh, you know, knee-high to a grasshopper and left school at 15, went to work for a race team as a mechanic and then slowly worked my way through the British Formula 3 sort of scene back in the UK until 91 uh, when I got a chance to go and work at McLaren and, and then did a nine-year stint at McLaren in Formula 1, which was just amazing. And then stepped back, went back Formula 3 engineering. That's when I stopped mechanicing and went engineering and team management. And then same thing again, sort of worked my way through the system. Ended up back in Formula One in 2005 and six. The workload there was incredible. Uh, it was enjoyable, but it was absolutely incredible. And I had a very small daughter at the time growing up. So we sort of took the family decision to come to Australia and the sort of more race, recent history you're aware of. So uh, I've been here 15 years now already, I think. That move to Australia, what drove that? Other than your daughter Darcy being young at the time, what really influenced that decision? I think the biggest thing was my quality of life was really going through the floor. And all of us in this industry, you put every ounce of your body and soul and effort into it, but equally so does your family. And I was really at a point where we would, I was just working so hard. I was, you know, falling asleep in my car, driving down the M40 at night and so nearly, and so many accidents could have easily happened. And I just got to the point and Gene did, we need to just, we need to change this or something bad is gonna happen. So, I mean, I'd been in Melbourne for the Formula One race um, in March. I called up with James Courtney for dinner one evening. And then two, three months later, he rang me up and said, oh, I remember that guy that we met for dinner. I said, yeah. He said, well, they need a team manager. Are you interested? And I was just at that point, I'd just done six weeks away from home for Grand Prix without going home. And um, I thought this is just, I haven't got my balance of life and, you know, in my, in my life, it's not right. So um, that's when we sort of said, okay, if we're going to do it, Darcy was six at the time, I think. Time to do it. Came down here and yeah, wouldn't want to go back anymore. <laughs> Never look back. Well, yeah. I certainly know what that's like. <laughs> now, looking back at this incredible journey that you've just summarised, what would you say is a really good memory and a bad memory? Good memories are easy. I mean. It's all been great. I'm blessed, you know, I'm working in an industry that I love. It's my life, it always will be my life. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. So I'm really grateful for that. So, I mean, my time at McLaren was special. I think anyone that gets to work in an environment like that and working with the guys like, you know, Ron Dennis and, and just the level of, and Adrian Newey and Ayrton Senna and Hakkinen and Prost and these guys, so they're just, they're household names before a reason, but they're actually behind the scenes, they're just, great, really beautiful individuals as well. So good at what they do, so passionate about they, what, what they do and their dedication was unquestionable. I think I'd learned so much there. I think that shaped, you know, what be, what is the, the rest of my life and my career. So I take a lot of satisfaction and enjoyment and pleasure and motivation from that period in my life. And so that was probably the one of the highlights. Low lights, you know, you hate talking about it, but unfortunately in this game, it is dangerous and you do every now and again, you're there at the wrong day, wrong place and, and people lose their lives. So, you know, I was there in Imola, May the 1st, 94 with Ayrton when he died. Those things make you emotional and I still feel emotional talking about it now. So the low points, you don't want to remember them, but you have to remember them because they shape how you look out, you know, how you do your work, how, how much effort you put into things and emphasis you put on things at the right place, right time. So that. You've got to take motivation from those things, but they are pretty low and no one likes to see that stuff. No, absolutely. Coming off the back of what you've just talked about, is there a best piece of advice that you've received over the years? 
No, but I think the, all I would say is to any sort of mechanic, engineer, anywhere you are in this industry, your actions matter and your actions count. And you can always be held accountable to them. I'm not saying that in a, in a bad way or a, or a forceful way, but you have to be very, very careful about what you do. You have to think, you have to pay attention. You can't, you know, if you lose something loose on a race car, and the guy goes out there and you know the chain of events go the wrong way you can end up in the coroner's office now you can't work with that weight on your shoulders all the time but every now and again you do need to remind yourself it's a serious job now we all love this it's a sport for us but it's actually a business as well and you, so i try and just keep that at the back of my mind and that's what i would say to anyone new coming into this game it's a great game it's a great business but you, there can be dire consequences so just keep focused Keep it real, keep it realistic, but enjoy it as well. Now you've worked across a range of high performance teams as we've just been hearing about. What are some of those reoccurring themes that have cropped up along your journey in those high performing teams? What habits do they all have? What traits they all have? Is there something in particular individuals that you've noticed crop up again and again? The desire to do the job perfectly or right and people who will go the extra little inch to do the job right and set the bar at the right level and, and demand that their employees try and work to that same level of professionalism, presentation, uh, detail. The, the eyes in the detail, but the, the good racers are the detail people. They're the ones that they want the 0.01s crossed off, you know, and it's just similar. I've seen it in Formula One, I've seen it in supercars. The best teams are the ones that put the effort in and there's no there's no shortcuts, you can't shortcut to get to where you want to get to. You've got to put the hard yards in, you've got to put the work in, and the effort, and the dedication, and then you, that's how you get the results. And 100% see that in individuals, both in Europe and in Australia. Motorsport is such a team sport, and quite often if you're coming in from the outside, what you see is an individual driver on the track, but within the industry everyone knows what a massive team sport it is. So how do you get individual people in a team who might not naturally be team players, how do you get them to collectively lift their game in order to find that 0.001% that we were just talking about that's a reoccurring theme in those high performance Yes, yeah. I think it's a bit of a culture thing, you've got to have the right culture and Funnily enough, in these big teams that are successful, they've got the right culture. They normally see their leader, they normally see the person at the top, you know, sometimes down in the trenches and, and put in the hard yards with all the other people within the business. They're definitely people that will drive you hard, but then they reward you hard. You know, you've got to, you ask a lot from your staff, but equally you've got to give a lot back from the human side and the humanity side. They're the key attributes that you need, but you've got to lead by example. You've got to, you know, your father, for example, he's in there. He, he knows what's going on. He's in with the engineers, he's in with the mechanics, he's in the machine shop, he's in the fab shop. He says hello to all of his people. You've got to have that ability for your people to come and talk to you about anything, work or home, and you've got to be compassionate. But equally, you're, you're working them hard and you're driving them hard, and when you're having good days, you share that success with them and you reward them whichever way you choose to do that. And then when times are tough, you're there in the trenches with them and you're trying to motivate them and, and get them to see you know, or understand the areas where it's not working at the moment and work on those areas. So you've got to lead by example. You can't do this industry or job. You can't do this from afar. You can't do it at the end of a telephone or the end of a conference call. You've got to be there, touching it, feeling it with your people. Living and breathing every moment of it exactly. along with them. It's the only way. One of the skills that we need from people in a motorsport team is the ability to be practical and to be able to think on your feet and especially as we've noticed across the last year and a half with COVID, you need to be able to think quickly. So can you explain how being practical helps in motorsport? How does it all tie together to, to lift that performance? Yeah, I think um, like in my, my career, I, I was hands-on. I was. You know, I'd 15 when I started in a race team, I couldn't pull an engine apart or a gearbox apart or a dampers apart. But you learn how to do that. I think you need to have your eyes and ears open. And you've got two of those and only one mouth, so you've got to listen and, and look and maybe not talk all the time. But you, you need to get in there and if you're hands-on, if you understand how an upright works, if you've pulled one apart, looked at it, inspected it, put it back together yourself with your own hands, it's totally different to someone who can just look at it on a piece of paper and expect to know how it works so the practical side of it is very important and it was important for me that's why our mechanics 
for the first sort of 15 years of my career I was hands-on building the cars and putting them together and understanding how each individual part works and its interaction with the rest of the car or the rest of the project. So I think the people that can cross over, that have got that good intellectual knowledge, but the good hands-on ability to walk in and get in there themselves and understand the part, I think that's a, that's a good attribute to have or to develop as a person. Motorsport is not only about practicality, but also about innovation and progression and being able to think progressively in order to keep pushing the boundaries of what we do. How important is it to keep motorsport as a progressive sport and as a progressive industry? Oh, it's 100%. It's, uh, from a business perspective, innovation and evolution is in motorsport, is, it's perfect. You know, this is where we are developing systems that end up in road cars that your family or your children will be using or relying on for their safety and their life's adventures in the future. So motorsport has, has always pushed the boundaries, it's always cutting edge, Formula One and World Endurance, especially those sorts of championships are, you know, they're developing new propulsion systems, gearbox systems, electronics, hybrid systems, all those things are proven in the environment, in our environment, they're taken to the extreme and then they're diluted somewhat and put in a, in a road car for the everyday, uh, everyday person to benefit from. So the, this industry is it's very innovative, it's extremely useful. We're learning so much here and everyone gets to use that, the benefit of that in the future. It's, it's integral to what we do. It is a sport, it's a competition, but you still always want to develop things as well. We've talked about being progressive in terms of the technical side of the sport, but what other areas is it important to be progressive in as well? I think the human side is probably changing a little bit. I think COVID has just been a, it's been a, not a scary experience, but it's been an enlightening experience. I think people are a little bit more in touch with their staff now. They're actually, you know, they're thinking how we can get the best from our people without them, without putting the stress and pressure on them that this whole pandemic has, has given each other. We're, I think we're becoming a little bit more inclusive. I think we're actually knowing that, you know, our, our people have problems. They have problems at home, they have problems at work. And I think this has been a little reminder that we need to be more in touch with our staff and our people to make sure we're helping them with all sorts of challenges that life's thrown up. So important, that's it fantastic way of looking at progression and not just a technical term. Going back to the technical side though, and I know that it's something that at this current time that we're doing this interview is something that you may or may not be able to divulge too much about, but tell us about your role in Gen 3, the journey that you've taken so far on this project and where you see it going over the next year or so. Yeah, first of all, Gen 3 is incredibly important for our business. It's very much needed. You know, cars at the moment, whilst we've, we have great racing, I don't think anyone can dispute our racing is close, it's competitive, it's interesting, it, it makes great TV. We still need to evolve, we still need to make sure the car is relevant for the manufacturers and for the fans. So the whole Gen 3 journey is really about, it's that next step. Normally we do these every seven, eight, nine years. So we need to make our car more inclusive so manufacturers can come to us with a, with a nice halo cars like the Camaro or the Mustang and fit on our chassis without distorting the factory feel and the DNA of the road car. So the, the big thing for this is, is fitting those halo cars on our cars without bastardising them. So it's very important. We've got to keep it relevant. We've got to keep the sport sustainable. This, the sport, as you know, can be very expensive. It can turn into an arms race if the rule book isn't right. To get the rule book right, you've got to have the right product. So I think we're now we're developing the right product. I think our racing going forward should be great. We've, we've still got to go and prove that. But um, we've got two great manufacturers with us currently. We want to be able to bring more in. So we want to open the door. We want to pull down the barriers of entry. Sometimes people looked at our engines in the past. You know, they've come into the series and they've, it's taken them multi-millions of dollars to develop their engine up to the level that our current engine is. So we need to bring that back a little bit and make the whole sport more attainable for some of the manufacturers but sustainable for the teams. And on a personal note, where do you see your future journey taking you in supercars over the next, it, not necessarily in supercars, but in motorsport um, over the next five years or so? Oh, look, for me, five years, I want to stay in the role I'm in or in the business that I'm in, in supercars. Um, I've, I've done a good portion of my time here in Teamland, which was great. I had a lot of success um, within a couple of teams very rewarding. I'm actually enjoying being 
now in the governing body side of the sport. Been working for supercars themselves, it's, it's completely different. You don't go to a race and think if you're going to win or lose. So um, getting your satisfaction out of the role is, is a little bit harder, but it's different. I think if we go to a good event and we have good racing and no one ends up in the steward's office and we have no controversy, then I sort of go home thinking, okay, that's a tick. I've, I've had a good weekend. But yeah, I seem, I'm, I'm enjoying where I'm at. I'm looking forward to this new car and, and the evolution of that and seeing where that goes. So for me, my next five years, you know, I'd like to be carrying on doing the same thing. I don't want to be moving around. You know, I know I've moved a couple of times, sometimes for the right reason, sometimes for the wrong. I, I want some stability for me at the moment. I think Australia is that. I don't see myself going back to Europe. America one day, you never know. But if I went back to Europe, I'd want to be in Formula One again. But do I want to be doing 22 weekends a year? I probably don't. So um, this grey hair is starting to take over. I need my, I want my balance of life. And at the moment, I've got a good balance of life. They say Formula One is a young man's game. I think you could still go into it if you wanted to, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm being biased. I probably could. <laughs> oh, and I can, and I know I can, but it's just whether I want to. I'm actually, I'm quite happy. I've got a balance now. I think everybody in Australia, you, outside of work is just as important as inside of work. So I think Australia gives you that ability, so I'm enjoying being here. Well, ATB, it's been fantastic to talk to you, get your insights, hear more about your journey. So thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Anytime, Jess.